flipping houses, it's a glorified job. Yes, you're making those big chunks of money, 30, 40, 80 thousand dollars, you know, when you flip a house, if you're in higher market, sometimes it's higher than that. Those are great. And people can do two of those in a year and replace their income at their full-time job in a lot of cases. But passive income that just keeps growing and is generational, I mean, that's what I'm all about now. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 373. Today, we're going to talk with a married couple who together have weathered the ups and downs of real estate investing through good and difficult markets. Back in 2007, Glenn and Amber Schwarm owed $80,000 on their credit cards, and they had a family to take care of. They turned to real estate investing just as the market began crashing. Still, they persisted with their flipping and renovation business and have since helped others flip over 1,000 homes worth over $85 million. Glenn and Amber recently published their first book, The Birth of the Everyday Real Estate Investor. Glenn and Amber, congratulations on your book and welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having Great us. intro. Yeah, awesome. I always enjoy talking with a husband and wife because it's such an interesting dynamic when you have a couple who are, are doing real estate together. But first, tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got started investing in real estate. I actually started back long before I even knew Amber existed. I'm 54 now and today, and I started when I was actually 19 years old, bought my first two rental properties and bought them with a, a simple assumption back in the late 80s, early 90s, and subsequently lost both of them to foreclosure. So it was not a good run for me in business a long, long time ago, and took me down a rough path there for a bit. And then time went on, I helped a lot of my friends flip houses and I was around it constantly, never stopped educating myself. And Amber and I connected, we were friends for a while, business partners in another venture, and we bought our first rental property in 2003. And I wanted to buy rentals, like I wanted to buy, I love residual income and I wanted rental income, that's what I wanted, that passive income. But this one wanted to flip houses. So she wanted to flip for those big chunks of cash. And we, for cash flow purposes, we needed to do that at that time too. Yeah. So it was, it, we wanted to make money to pay off those credit cards and figure it out. So we started flipping in 07, did all the work ourselves in the first flip, first three actually. And long story short, here we are a thousand deals later and we're still cranking out about a hundred deals a year. We live in, we live on the coast in Florida and our business operates in upstate New York. And we've got Oh, about 50 some doors, 50 some rentals that we own, mostly all houses, single families. And we're, we're building that portfolio out and away we go. Now it's more of a passive business and passive income for us. Amber, I'm interested in hearing your side of that. Like, how did you come to investing in real estate? You know, I think some of it was just, we, we definitely had an interest in real estate, but we didn't know what we didn't know. Like, you know, when I, when I thought about renting houses or being a landlord, that's exactly what I thought of it would be is I'm going to get the two o'clock in the morning phone call that the toilet's overflowing and, you know, I'm locked out of my house or whatever. I didn't really realize the bigger picture that you can have people that handle all that for you in a property management company. So what's funny is I did, you know, I, I think a lot of people are attracted to that flipping initially because that's like the sexy part of real estate. I get to take something ugly and make it into something beautiful and the whole design process and all that. And that it that does have its appeal and it does have its profit margin as far, you know, that that we needed those big chunks, chunks of cash at that time. But I've done a total 180. Like, yes, there are houses that are still great to flip, but I want to build our rental portfolio. So it, it, I, I really had a, a shift as I've learned the business and learned the ins and outs of real estate. and But a lot of people, flipping houses is a good entry to real estate. Those first two rentals that you bought at the age of 19, I would say, where'd you go wrong? How, why did you lose those in foreclosure? I was a dumb kid that they were, number one, they were not in a good area. They were, they were in the ghetto in upstate New York. So I struggled, right? I was a, my own landlord, right? And I struggled because they weren't paying rent and they had every excuse in the world and they paid me cash. And that was the problem, right? I got some money from social services and section eight, 
I forgot which agencies I had. I think they were both on this, these two houses. And the landlord or the owners that sold them to me, it was really nothing down. I, so I had, I took over an assumable mortgage, an FHA assumable mortgage. They don't have many more, but they're, I think, but there's FHA assumable mortgage. I took over a simple assumption, cost me a hundred bucks. And then the owners held the rest in a second. And I love the creative aspect of all that. So I set it up. So I had no skin in the game. I had no skin period because I was 19. I was dead broke. I had nothing. So when the and when money the, in your pocket, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so all of a sudden the, the water heater would break and it'd be like, well, that's going to be, you know, back then, let's say it was 300 bucks to have it fixed. And I'd be like, I don't have 300 bucks. So I had to figure out, I didn't know what to do. Right. I was always trying to figure out Rob Peter to pay Paul to get this. I had no reserves whatsoever. And I was getting cash in my pocket and it'd be Friday when they pay. So I'd be like, Hey guys, let's go out and have some drinks, so you know? And then the, the bank would call us and we, we need the mortgage payment. I'm like, mortgage payment. So I just, it really was just dumb. Like I didn't, you know, nowadays I, we have a, we have a 23 year old son and we have 18 year old daughter uh, and younger kids also. But I think that the youth today is so much more educated. They have so much more available at their fingertips to learn from. And we, I'm not blaming that. I'm not blaming my idiot money management on anything other than me just not being smart with it. You know, just being a dumb, a dumb 19 year old. And having you know a thousand bucks cash in my pocket, I was loaded, baby. My friends loved me. I was buying drinks all day at the, you know. So that's that's really just, it. Was just bad decisions on my part. But you knew you liked real estate. I always, I never stopped loving. I was reading the Robert Allen books way back in the day, and no money down, no money down, all that. Yeah, no money down for the eighties, no money down for the nineties, and all that. And the funny part was, it was before I met Everson, my first wife. I used to sit on Sunday mornings and watch Carlton Sheets, the infomercial, and I'd watch it over and over and over. And finally, my wife who was very, very passive person. Like she wasn't aggressive at all. One day she ordered it and said, I'm so sick of you watching that show. I just bought the thing for you. Stop. It's I, I spent 300 bucks. Just, just please. And so I didn't, you know, it was actually after that, that we hired a coach from who, Carlton Sheets, Carlton Sheets to buy, to build rentals. And that's why we bought our first rental. So Amber and I, we both had our own spouse, our own lives going on. She was in Texas yep. and I was in New York and we were, we were business partners in another venture, a network marketing business. So we had worked together for several years. We said, let's, let's buy a rental. So we decided to do it in New York since I was, I had a little bit of experience and we thought we'd just start to build a portfolio together. And that's when we bought that first rental. And I, we still have that. Rental I mean, we day. still do. I, it was the worst. That was another horrible decision that Brian, that house had. So your listeners, you know, if you're in the rentals, you understand that there's there's location, location, location. Well, this had this was on a busy road, not a great start out of the gates, busy road with dirt all the time across the street from a chemical plant, a large chemical plant. Next door was a bar called the Bad Pig. It was it was owned by a cop, cop, a cop that was thrown off the force. So it was called the Bad Pig. It was a biker bar, Harley Biker Bar, Hell's Angels. Some people came in there. Next to that was a railroad track that brought chemicals into the chemical plant. Behind us was a dump, right? We the, were so desperate to get into a house that were like the first thing that came along. We're like, let's yeah. Go. We owned that for a month, and then one of the neighbors said, "I don't know if you're aware, but an 18 year old committed suicide, hung himself in your garage." I'm like, "Did this house have any more bad karma?" And so it. But we we managed to make uh, years later. We re, we redid that house. We flipped it to ourselves essentially and made that a profitable venture. But, but the the, le the lesson learned with that house though is you know even with real estate even when you make a bad choice there's still a good exit strategy in mo most of the time with you know time. with with time we held onto that house now it's worth I mean quarter million probably yeah yeah so so even though it was a bad decision at that time it has paid for itself all along the way and now it's profitable. Amber, you had said that in the beginning you wanted to start flipping, and that was because you wanted the cash flow. You needed to to generate some cash flow. And now you you've kind of changed your perspective where you want to build a portfolio. Talk about that that change. Like, what kind of cash flow were you building? What what were you doing with that cash flow? And at what point did you realize, hey, we should probably keep some of these properties? We started holding on to just a couple here and there every year. That, that that was the best exit strategy for that house. But I think the thing that really was an aha moment for us was really when we moved here to Florida from New York, but to back up just a little bit. So we were so busy in our business and we were we had two more kids. So we were just busy with life. So we would buy those rental properties and they would just operate and we wouldn't, we didn't pay them much attention. You know, we were, the rents were getting paid when we had to do some little maintenance Probably in between manager. tenants. The property manager took care of all that. So they they just kind of sat and started building more and more equity. Like we didn't really 
pay much attention to him, like I said. So it came time to, for us to move to Florida. And we we live in a multi-million dollar house now. And when we were looking at this house and Glenn called the mortgage broker and it was like, you know, can I afford this? And we start looking at how much our rentals are bringing in and that passive income. And then we also added about 13 in the middle of all those, the, the traditional rentals, we added 13 short-term rentals. So like Airbnbs and those cash flow even better. So when we started realizing that our passive income covered our mortgage here and we weren't even paying attention to it, that was like an aha moment. That was really eye-opening. And I'm like, okay, you know, and, and there's some statistics out there. I've seen different ones, but it's like, you know, real estate typically doubles in value every 10 to 20 years, depending on the market. So that that's a big chunk of money to keep doubling every 10 years. And those 10 years are going to go by anyway. I mean, where where were you 10 years ago? Where are you now? Where will you be 10 years from now? And if you just think about having those rental properties and for me in the beginning, like if I if I put myself back in my shoes then and I think about somebody that's brand new listening to this, it's like, okay, I don't want to be a landlord and I don't want to have the the burden of another mortgage. But you don't. Like when you when you do this right and when you do it strategically, you know, your tenants are paying your mortgage for you. So that's not on your shoulders. And that equity, though, that keeps being built over the years and years and years, and that's not only helping our lifestyle now, but that's going to go on to our kids. So it's generational wealth, too. So flipping houses, it's a glorified job. Yes, you're making those big chunks of money, $30,000, $80,000, you know, when you flip a house, if you're in higher markets, sometimes it's higher than that. Those are great. And people can do two of those in a year and replace their income at their full-time job in a lot of cases. But passive income that just keeps growing and is generational, I mean, that's what I'm all about now. I think, Brian, too, one of the things that was really an eye-opener is that we ignored that account. We have that under a, a corporate name, and then we have all of our LLCs are structured under that. And I, I, I said, let it grow like a retirement account. I don't care. And it started, it started to accumulate some cash, you know. And then when Amber started to manage the Airbnb business, the short-term rental business, her, her and my son do that together. Her and our son do that together. And so they they fired me from that job. They said, we don't want you out. You have you have too many good ideas. Get out. You're an idea guy. Get out of here. Let, let us run that business. And so that was, we looked in there one day. We had like, you know, multiple six figures accumulated in there. And we went, well, that's interesting. I'm ignoring, here I'm ignoring that business. And it's doing quite well. So it's, it's it was really an eye opener for us. Yeah. And yeah, when. So I just want more now. I want more rentals. Yeah, she's bugging me now. I'm like, well, honey, I know we're you know, we're we're working on that. We're we're building a system to do that. So more yeah. doors, more doors, more doors. Yeah. It seems like from what you're saying, you've certainly done a, a, some of the heavy lifting on some of your properties. Certainly the fix the flips, but from a, the very beginning, you were hiring third party management. You were being more passive in in certain investments that you had. A lot of people are like, they're going to be all in on one side or all in on the other side. You're in both sides. Why is that? And what side do you prefer to be on? I love the rental business, but I also like, you know, we have a big education business where we teach people how to do what we do. And so the people are drawn to the cash flow. And so I have a, we, not, I keep saying, when I say I, I mean we, by the way. <laughs> so we have a team in New York that is so dedicated and they love what they do. And so we find rentals because we're looking for flips and wholesale deals up there in New York. And we've been in the market for so long up there. We've been doing it for 15, going on 16 years now. And we have a really strong brand. We're on TV. We're on, you know, all the major media. So we're really well known up there. So it's one of those things that it generates. It's a business that runs virtually without any input from us. So we, we've been able to make that a, you know, as passive as you can make it as an owner. I'm still involved in a meeting once a week. And I talk to my leaders a couple of times a week for different things here or there. But for the most part, it runs without our, our daily input. So that is a cash generator. It's a, it's a passive business, if you will. Because of that, you know, we're, we're closing on, on a nine unit next week that we stumbled onto through our marketing. Guy called up and said, I want to sell you. Sell it for 150000 under market value because he wants out. My, the, he, he's known of us for years. He was a golf course owner, so we knew him. He sold his golf course. He made lots of money. So I just want to get out. I don't want, I don't want the headache. I don't want, to, I don't want to list it. And so we keep finding deals because of that machine. So I'm hesitant to shut that machine down because it finds deals for us now. And and the truth is, every, you know, every property has a, a 
best exit strategy for that property. And right. depending on where the business is with cash flow, sometimes it makes sense to to flip a house versus rent it. We keep talking about we're, we're going to do it here in Florida, but I'm hesitant because we don't have the connections here. In New York, if, if something goes wrong, we call our project manager, it's taken care of. Or we have a property manager company and then a project manager who handles all the repairs and, and flips. So we have these people on staff. We don't have that staff here in Florida. So I, I know that would fall on me and I don't want to, I, I, we haven't gotten there yet. I keep telling Amber, let's just be careful not to get too many things going because I don't need the phone ringing. I've gotten away from that. So we are we like to build things out as systems, Brian. That's I think that's what it boils down for us. We yeah. like to build it in systems so that we can be, we like using people for their best and highest use. So if, you know, like we are good at leading, building companies, building systems, I don't want to be the guy out there, you know, plunging a toilet because we haven't set up a property management company or have enough connections to fix stuff when it breaks. Yeah, we we only that. did the work on the first first three flips ourselves, and yeah. then we started hiring everything out. And that's what we encourage all our students to do because you actually make a lot more money subbing it out versus doing it yourself simply because of like holding time and, and all that nonsense. But I think it's real estate investing is so cool though because you take two people like us, neither one of us had college degrees. We were completely green. Glenn still to this day doesn't know how to read a tape measure. <laughs> You know, like like we we didn't know anything like we have learned as we as we have gone along it started with one house and then it started with another and then we just kind of you know we made a business out of it and now it's our lifestyle like we we love being able to do this together and even working together as husband and wife that certainly had its challenges but we've we could no. we, we could do a whole other podcast no. but i you know it's i i love that real estate investing doesn't require any sort of special skill set. Like you don't have to have a degree. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't, nothing matters. Is If your drive is there and you're hungry enough and you're willing to learn what it takes, like you can do it. It's RPOA annual conference time again. And Green Property Management is excited to invite you to their RPOA conference booth for a special introduction to Green Property Management, a leading property management company in West Michigan. As you've heard me mention, Green Property Management manages over 370 doors for me, and I couldn't be happier. Their experienced team of professionals will be on site at the event, ready to answer any questions and provide insight into how they can help make your property investments run smoothly and professionally. Be sure to stop by the booth for more information about what they do and how they can help. Like me, you'll be glad you did. To contact Green Property Management directly, call 866-95-GREEN or visit their website at livegreenlocal.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. It really seems like you've been very successful in turning your real estate into a business and putting the team together and the systems together. And I'm wondering if you can entertain me here and inventory the different businesses you have under that real estate umbrella. It sounds like you have multiple businesses going on, kind of going back to that Robert Allen, multiple streams of income that you mentioned. You took that to heart, it seems like, and really internalized that. But not just inventory, what are the different businesses that Glenn and Amber are doing, but what is your level of activity in those businesses? Signature Home Buyers is our flipping, it's our real estate investing company, not just a flipping, but that's the one that goes out and finds deals. And that does wholesaling, flipping, and buys rentals and, and all that. There. That's the one that started it all. Right. Yeah. That's that we call that our that's kind of our core business. That's the one that, that we started. So that business is, like I said, that does about hundred deals a year. Involvement is really a few meetings a week. That it's in New York, so I'm not looking at houses. I mean, it's a you know we live in the coast in Florida, so I'm not we're not looking at that anymore. I have minimal involvement in in that one at all now. I used to do the project management and the design in that company, but now I'm you're not really involved. Not I'm not really it's fair involved to say at not all. at all. Yeah, yeah. And I I am just from a I'm grooming new leaders 
and they know that I want to step more and more out. So I'm grooming them. And they're really, when you find the right people, it's a game changer. But I had the wrong people for even up to this, even up to five months ago. And, and the, I found the right people inside my company in different spots, put them in the right spots and man, game changer. So that's that company. So I'm, I'm developing leaders in that company. Next is we have a brokerage because we do a hundred deals a year. We didn't want to pay another broker. So Amber became a licensed yeah. broker and she's never sold a house in her life. No. So it's, we, we got qualified through just through points, points just because we had the experience. Again, we have no involvement in that business at all. That really is run by one of the, one of the women who runs my dispositions at signature home buyers our dispositions at signature home buyers. So she's the broker. So she runs all that day to day. We have a couple of agents that do some you know, other leads that come in. So they'll handle other leads out there and do that. We have certainly our rental portfolio that is that takes everything on. That's mostly managed by a property management company. The involvement there really is looking at reports and any repairs over 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. I'm really involved with a decision, yes or no, or what, what should we do with it? And then Sweet Dreams, which is our, yeah, you talk about our that. short term rental That's company, under is, that umbrella, is under the rental portfolio. So like Glenn was saying, our, my son and I manage that one, and I'm pretty involved in that. You know, we have a meeting at least once a week, and if there's issues, we we deal with those on a case by case basis. But you're but you're here. The properties are up there, and even right? even you guys manage them. Our son, our son, he gets a he gets ten percent of of all revenue in the door. You know, his job is to revenue and keep the in customer service, and you know, perfect age, twenty three years old. He manages the whole thing over his phone, yeah. and the way they go. So, and we're able to teach him and and learn, you know, help him grow as a as a potential future business owner with us. So, but you're involved in that. But how many hours a week do you think you put in that? You know, maybe maybe five. You know, if we have yeah. a new one coming up, I there might be a a, a chunk of time that I have yeah. to spend, you know, doing the design and ordering the stuff for it. But yeah. but yeah, it's minimal. Are you self managing your own rentals then, or? Yeah, it was funny. About three years ago, I said to I, we had like maybe thirty five or forty houses then, and I I I remember saying to him, "We paid them how much last year? Fifty five thousand dollars. Well, we what could hire. Yeah, we should hire somebody for that. Maybe it's time." And I I said, "Send me a list of what they do." And I they had an actual printout. My team had a print. They go, "Well, here it is." And it was about an inch thick, and I looked at it, and the first page is all about. Toilet unclogging, middle of the night locks. And I read the first three pages. I, I passed it back and said, you guys are good. Keep up the good work. <laughs> I said, I, I want no part of that business. So, yeah, so we don't manage our own. For me, that feels like a headache. So we try and stay away from headache businesses. And our biggest time that we're investing right now is in our education business because we love what we do and we love teaching people. It was about the third house. I always knew I, I had a speaking career, if you will, in network marketing before this. They used to fly me around and speak. I never knew I had chops until they let me speak one time. And I was like, wow, I love this. I love I love getting people motivated, inspired, but I want to give them a plan. I don't want to just leave the room and go, I feel great, but now what? You know, I, I didn't want that. So when Amber and I got together, I, I said, we have to find something that I can let get that outlet out of me. I love, I love that. And the third house, this is the, this is thousand houses to go, right? So this is 17 years ago. I walked in the third house that we are still doing the work ourselves. I remember saying to Amber, this is it. This is what I go, we could, we could teach this. We I can we could build a system and we could teach people how to do what we do. Because we just did two houses. We're on our third. We're no, we're nobody special. We could teach people how to do this. I said, but I want to prove the model first. Unlike the youth of today that do one deal and they now are on social They're media. Oh, they know everything. Yeah, they know everything. So that's not so. I said, let's prove the model. And Brian, we didn't open Vester Pro, our coaching company, until we'd done 400 deals. At our 400th deal, then we we're like, I think we have enough experience now to open that business. So we did. And now that business, you know, that that's our biggest business is about 45 or 47 team members there. And we we put on once about once a month what's called the home flipping workshop. We put that on, and we do a three day virtual workshop. Went virtual because of COVID. And we we made that work, and it's been amazing because I don't have to travel anymore, and neither do people that come to see us. And we teach a strategy, right? We teach them how to flip a couple houses in your first year to make a hundred grand. Try try to aim for a fifty thousand profit in your first deal, and then let's move you into rentals, and let's move you into systemizing your business to step out of it. So that business, I probably spend twenty plus hours a week on because now, in the new world we live in, I have to make content and content. And content, because that's how you get the word out there now is content, right? So 
I love it. I'm learning. I'm learning a whole new skill in that. That's it. What mistakes do you see being made right now, Amber? I mean, what what is the flipping world like given the higher interest rates? Well, a lot of people have the brakes on. So I do think that this period of time is going to filter out some of the people that, that, and that's probably a good thing. There needs to be a cleansing of the industry. But, you know, people maybe bought a little too high right when the market was starting to shift. And so now they're getting stuck in those houses. I know even in the Airbnb or short-term rental space, a lot of people bought low but then now they're starting to see their profits dip because people aren't traveling as much with, you know, the recession and and people aren't just spending as much. So a lot of them are getting stuck in places. You know, if people if people are just buying houses based off of today's current rates and they're not getting creative with like financing and maybe doing like some subject to stuff, they could get in trouble with that kind of stuff. I know I, I, I'll take a little different approach. I think some of the mistakes that people are making right now is they're not buying the right asset. And I think that I think that putting the brakes on is a horrible mistake right now yeah. for people that are investors. I think that you should definitely be looking for deals, but just you know you have to change your underwriting. Like you've got to figure out what what number do you have to buy at to make sure that you're protected. And so I think a big mistake is people saying I'm not going to buy right now. And I think that you're I think that you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because we keep buying yep. and we focus on on fundamentals. I'm not a you know, a lot of people in the past, they got so lucky, you know, Brian, if you've been in this space for a while, which I'm sure I know you have, so many people would buy a house, make every mistake in the world, and pure appreciation over six months would cover every sin. They walk out and go, I made every mistake and I made $70,000 and I wanted to punch them in the head. I'm like, this is, you have no idea how to really flip a house, you know? And so I think the biggest mistake now is that, that some people are not respecting where we are in the market. So they are not being cautious. I think you should, number one, you should be buying houses but I think you should focus on the first time home buyers. That's where I think that the market is because for me, that's where the market always is. It's always this, that will never go away. That market never dies out. You should be buying houses that you can then flip to first time home buyers or right. turn them into rentals. Yeah. I think with what's going on in the market, I wonder, I'm wondering, you know, five, 10 years from now, how hard is it going to be to get your hands on a single family home? And I think if it's going to be that much harder, if the inventory gets that much dwindled down over the years and gets more and more expensive just so the elite can, can afford a house, I'll tell you, I think that's going to be a valuable piece of real estate to hang on to. So that's my personal opinion on single family homes. Well, my crystal ball doesn't know it's broken, but I that's what I that's what I kind of think. You know, I'm thinking to myself, man, more people are buying houses, buying rentals, and a lot of people aren't going to want to sell because they're in the 3% mortgages. We got our house at, the reason we could afford our house down here was it was at 2.85%. When I heard the payment, I went, what? <laughs> that was like an eye opener. Like, wow, we can, we have, we, we make triple that payment in our passive income. This is right. amazing. But it's a new reality now with, with higher rates. So you do have to change your, your parameters. As we wrap it up here, Amber and Glenn, each of you tell me what your favorite hack or app is. I'm going to take kind of a, a life approach at this because when, when you have multiple businesses and family and everything else, sometimes it can be hard to fit it all in. So for me, my my best life hack, I think, is staying really focused in the moment that I'm in. So if I'm if I have work to do, I just try to stay really, really focused on that. If I'm spending time with my kids and my family, I try not to have my laptop or my phone out. You know, I I I stay really, really focused on on what I'm in instead of, you know, being like a squirrel <clears throat> racing all the different nuts that are falling from the tree. So for me. Another odd answer, similar to what you're saying. I mean, odd, probably not what people are thinking. I, I'm not in the day-to-day -day in my businesses. So I, I wouldn't be fair for me to say what my favorite, because I don't even log into our CRM. Like I'm that removed from my flipping company. We have Salesforce and I'm not in it. So I don't, people, they, I just say, just send me the report I want to see. I don't want to log in and look at a bunch of stuff, right? So for me, I started something about six months ago as an app that was a game changer for me. And if you're around our around us at the time, you'll know that our tagline and our coaching business is a real estate of mind because we're all about mindset. And so I have an app called Self Talk. And literally I play it in the background when I'm doing whatever. If I'm out for a walk on the beach or if I'm driving my kids to school this morning, I had a flat tire. So I had to sit there for hours. So I listened to it for a while. It just plays very positive, not just affirmations, but just ways you should be talking to yourself. And it programs in the back of your mind so that you can stay in a better spot in life. And I've noticed a huge difference. In, and I think you could probably speak for that. Oh yeah. People, and if people don't have audible, I mean, you know, I don't have time to sit and read, but I do have times where I'm driving kids, you know, here and yeah. there back to school. So like audible is a great way to learn. And then another great app just for organization is Asana. It, 
especially with like business stuff, but you could also do it for your family stuff. You just like put tasks in there and put dates on them and assign, you know, tag who's responsible for doing what. And it just keeps things from falling through the cracks. So you don't keep it all in your brain. It's actually on an app. What was the one you just said? Self-talk? Yeah, there's a there's a book called Shad Helmstetter. What, what to say when you talk? Yeah, to yourself. what to say when you talk to yourself? Brilliant it's a, book. It's a book, and I've read it several times. And it was a, the book was really helpful. But he mentions this self talk app that he had, and it's so funny. It was twenty bucks a month, and I'm like, I'm not paying twenty bucks a month. That's too much. <laughs> That's too much. You know, we make good money, so I'm just funny about. I'm so funny, funny about twenty bucks a month. Yeah, I'll spend I'll spend ten grand on a jet ride, but I, I won't spend twenty bucks a month. You won't get me on that, right? So dumb sometimes, but I. I started that and it's again, that's been a game changer for me just to just to help help start my day by programming the way I'm thinking. So I don't because in this economy, you could easily go down a rabbit hole. If you turn the news right now. Oh, it's noise. The and, news is nothing but noise. Yeah. You turn, you turn the news, even you read the financial papers, and you see about recession coming and looming and all this stuff. And, and I don't know. It's got to hit eventually. I just don't know when. And it, it was, some people say it's, it is now and it's definitely different now. But man, I tell you, not. For us, we just haven't felt that effect. You gotta keep so. living your life. But you gotta, you gotta you gotta make sure that you're looking at it from the right perspective. And I'll I'll close that thought with this. This morning, literally took my kids to school. We were joking around the whole time. I had a good time. It was a good morning. Not every morning is a good morning going to school, but this morning was a good morning. I pulled in, I walked them in, they held my hands. So I love their they're seven and ten, seven and, and ten. ten. So my those days are gonna go away soon. So they held my hands. I I walked out smiling, got in my car, and I was like, that feels funny. I pulled out and went, that feels funny. And I looked out and my front tire was flat. I mean, all the way flat. And I literally didn't have a moment of, oh my God, this is terrible. I got to get to work. I said, well, I got an hour to kill. This is pretty good. It took three hours, but I ended up, I spent time on Audible and I spent time listening to that stuff. So I was able to take what could be a bad thing in my day and turn it into a good thing. And I hope that, you know, maybe listeners are, are hearing that and realize that if you put the right stuff in your brain, you can get those skills. Now, I'm not perfect. I don't, I don't nail that. I don't nail that every time, but I really try hard to do that. I think that the more you can, in this economy with all the noise, if you'd focus on all the good out there, I think that you'll see all the good out there. You'll have a much greater experience in life. Share with our audience how they can find out more about you or get in touch. The best way is probably glennandamber.com. As you mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of different companies and a lot of stuff going on. So we tried to put it all in one place to make it simple, but that's got links to our podcast and our. we have a TV show out. We have a book, all of our courses, our home flipping workshop link, all of our social media connections. Those are all on there at glennandamber.com. It's been a pleasure talking with both of you. I've enjoyed learning about your different businesses and the way you've managed to kind of automate and systematize and build a team so that you're you're pretty much passive in a lot of what you do, even though it's very, it seems to be doing quite well for you. So thanks for sharing a lot of your tips and insight. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thanks, thanks so Brian. much. You too. Thanks yeah, for having fun. us. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.